America in the 21st century is a picture of diversity. So too are our schools. Not only ethnic, economic and intellectual diversity, but also physical and psychological diversity. Since the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, America's schools now do a better job than ever of educating all children. It is the right thing to do, yet it is not without challenges. Do you see anything there that... How do our educators learn about the variety of medical conditions before them? The Epilepsy Foundation has made this video to help you learn about seizures in school. I had a stroke in utero, which caused a brain injury. The brain injury caused my epilepsy. The next thing I know, his eyes roll in the back of the head, and he just collapses in my arms, and he starts shaking. And in the fall, I hit my head on the granite, and then on the hardwood floors. It was just scary. It was a moment of panic. What do I do? When would it happen? Where would it happen again? You worry about your kids, <laughs> you know? You don't want them to be hurt, so you think about it a lot. It's much more common than most people appreciate. Somewhere around one out of every hundred people in the United States has epilepsy right now. And somewhere between three and five percent of the population has had a seizure at some point in their lives. Some people call epilepsy or seizures a brainstorm, a storm in the brain. But what does that mean? Well, it means that this normal activity where the cells are signaling from one to the next to the next is basically doing it in an uncontrolled way. So it keeps going and going and going. Depending where in the brain that activity happens, your seizure looks different. It could be a repetitive thought. It could be a vision. It could be a smell. It can also be the classic thing that, that people uh, tend to think of uh, when they're thinking of seizures, and that's the, the tonic-clonic seizure, or what we used to call the grand mal. It can also be on the other side of the coin, what we used to call petty mal, where all we're seeing is an absence of a person. They just go blank for a moment, stare off, maybe a little bit of movement. And so we have the huge range from the biggest, the strongest, the most worrisome for most people, the grand mal or the tonic-clonic, all the way down to a little bit of movement or simply staring. More than 300,000 students in the U.S. live with epilepsy. Working in the school system, chances are you'll encounter a student having a seizure. When he started school was the biggest fear of my whole entire life, um, not knowing when you were going to get that call. And then she started having a seizure. We were pretty scared. So I sent some students down to the security office. I sent another student to another room to hit someone else's security button, and I tried to call the clinic. The clinic went directly to voicemail. <laughs> Attempting to get help is the right thing to do, but how can a teacher assist while waiting for help to arrive? The first thing they should do is make the, the child safe. And so that involves making sure there isn't something near the child's head in particular, okay, that could produce some danger. The next thing you do, if the person has glasses on, you want to take them off, loosen their clothing. If you can ease them to the ground, allow them go to, the, to go to the ground, and then turn them on their side. It's helpful to do that because what's often happening, and, and it makes people very scared, is that you hear g g guttural sounds, as though they're having trouble breathing. And so what you're trying to do is to allow the head to turn to the side so the saliva, okay, which the person isn't able to swallow at that time, can come out of the mouth. You will want to get help. In the school rooms, they have buttons that you can push to get help. You can ask someone else to go get help. Uh, call the health room. And if this is someone that's known to have seizures, they'll come with an individualized care plan, which will say if this person has medications or not. Things not to do are to either put something in someone's mouth or think that they're going to swallow their tongue. Mm -hmm. The tongue is actually attached to some pretty big muscles in the throat. And so while patients may bite their tongues, they aren't going to swallow them. The more dangerous thing is that if you put something in someone's mouth that's rigid, they may crack a tooth. If it's something that's soft and they could potentially bite off, then the part that they bite off may actually be aspirated or go into their lungs. Safety, clear the environment, 
roll them to their side, um, and then just stay with them uh, and and allow it to uh, to to run its course. There is nothing that a person can do to change the course of that seizure. A tonic-clonic seizure is not usually dangerous to the individual, but there are a number of points to consider when deciding whether emergency medical services should be called or whether the student should be transported to the hospital. Medical services should always be called for students having a first-time seizure. EMS should also be called under any of these conditions. The student is injured or has badly bumped his or her head. The seizure happened in water. The convulsive portion of the seizure lasts longer than five minutes. A second seizure begins shortly after the first concludes. The person does not regain consciousness within five to 10 minutes, or the person has diabetes or is pregnant. But if a student who is diagnosed with epilepsy has a brief seizure and has not injured him or herself, calling EMS may not be necessary. When you know that someone has a seizure disorder, uh, and someone has a seizure in your presence, whether it's a generalized tonic-clonic seizure or a different type of a seizure, generally speaking, you do not need to call 911 or rescue services unless the seizure is going on for more than five minutes. When calculating the time, keep in mind there's always a period following the convulsions where the person is unconscious or extremely groggy. This is known as the postictal stage, and this time period is not included in the five-minute calculation. You may see somebody being very sleepy, uh, uh, really poorly, slowly responsive, um, and that would be described as the postictal stage. This seizure is over, uh, and that's an important thing for people to understand because the postictal period may go on for quite some time, for many minutes, uh, even 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and in that time frame, that's not the seizure. So that doesn't mean hello, the seizure is going on, and you need to call medical services. You need to be there reorienting the individual calming them, saying you know what happened, and that they're going to be right back up and doing things shortly. It's not something people need to freak out about because chances are that person's had a lot of seizures before and they've bounced back every time. Another common form of seizure that is not nearly as obvious is the complex partial seizure. Because only a small part of the brain is affected, a person may still be able to perform gross motor skills like walking or sitting upright, yet be totally unaware of his or her actions. They may stare, mumble, repeat phrases, blink excessively, smack their lips, or pick at their clothing. However, they will be totally unresponsive to instructions because their consciousness is severely impaired. Let's say somebody were speaking to me. I might remember none of it. Kevin a little part of it, Kevin. or it might be all jumbled together. Kevin, huh. can you hear me? Huh. Can you hear me? Huh. It can look like something else. It can look like um, a student's not paying attention. It may look like a student is um, you know, using substances they're not supposed to be using. I think it's important that a teacher not assume that the student is simply not paying attention or is you know uh, daydreaming that they that they understand it is possible to have these more subtle forms of a seizure uh, where the mind sort of just checks out for a few minutes. Their consciousness is impaired. It's not lost, um, but they're clearly not processing language and they're not processing your intention. So that what you want to do is take harm out of their way, close the door. They will take the path of least resistance but a perception of being threatened will lead to somebody pushing away, hitting, uh, fending off what at least momentarily, as a reaction, is thought of a, uh, a threatening move. So that I think the most that you would want to do is guide. You don't want to restrict them. You don't want to force them to sit down. That is the last thing you want to do. A complex partial seizure can last from one to five minutes. When it's over, the person may be tired or may recover immediately. Emergency medical services do not need to be called if a person who is diagnosed with epilepsy experiences a complex partial seizure, unless they're not fully recovered within 30 minutes. There are two additional forms of seizures school staff should be aware of, simple partial and absence. 
When a person has a simple partial seizure, their consciousness is not affected because the abnormal brain activity is occurring only in one specific area of the brain. My arm is jerking. I, I can't stop it. It's not in my control. Brain that corresponds to that, the opposite side of the brain and the motor area of the brain is making this happen, but it's, it's uncontrolled and that's a seizure. Absent seizures, on the other hand, do affect consciousness and can easily be misinterpreted as daydreaming or ADHD in kids. Were they just blank staring spells, maybe, with some eye blinks? But again, this little thing. The complex partial, there's more confusion after it. The absence, right back. And when a person has an absence seizure, it's like a, a switch going on and off, okay? They're with you one moment, they're gone for a few seconds, and they're right back with you, picking up right where they left off. Oh, no special action is required if a student who is diagnosed with epilepsy experiences an absence seizure, except to make sure the student did not miss something important being taught at the time. However, if you witness repeated episodes that you suspect may be absence seizures and the student is not known to have epilepsy, parents or guardians should be informed. So epilepsy can come in many forms. On one end of the spectrum are extremely brief absence seizures that may occur multiple times a day. On the other end of the spectrum, tonic-clonic seizures that may occur only rarely, but when they do, can be traumatic for the individual. I ended up having a seizure in the hallway. And it's, it was bad because then classes changed and everyone saw me having a seizure. People are still ashamed of it. You know, diabetics have come out and they've been more comfortable with it. And epilepsy is still one of those things. You just sort of keep it in the closet. You don't want to come out and wear that sign that says, I have epilepsy. With my son having it, um, he's kind of outcast. Um, they think, oh, he's got seizures, you know, at this age, they're going out for sleepovers. My son, nobody ever asked him for fear that if they would have one, that I would hold them, count, you know, responsible. Yeah, I feel sad when they um, call, um, call me names. I have to sit out for gym sometimes, and that makes me feel uncomfortable. And people look at me like, what's wrong with you? Why? why are you sitting out? So I have to tell a few people and it hurts because they'll spread it around. And last year I, I didn't have any friends in gym. To have to wear something like that out on your shirt sleeve, so to speak, it's gotta be, you know, a very difficult, um, you know, difficult uh, cross to bear. Um, so I think that as much as we can do to support students, um, you know, make them um, realize that, you know, at school is a supportive place and, um, you know, we'll be there for you when these things happen and after they happen. I think it's important for the teacher and the administration to set a tone in the school setting of acceptance. Uh, epilepsy in students is just part of their individuality any type of bullying or teasing, and that could be, you know, making a funny look or, um, you know, anything verbal or aggressive in nature. And if it is seen, then there are going to be consequences and the teachers need to call it out right then and there. That's bullying and that will not be tolerated. I think the most important thing is to stress to kids that when they come back to the classroom, the student that had the seizure may feel a little uncomfortable about it and just to make them feel like they're still a part of the classroom. If you're a good friend of theirs, obviously you want to make them feel comfortable and welcome back. Afterwards, I think the, the best thing to, to talk about is that the fact that this is not a, um, this is not a condition of, uh, where, the, where the child is violent or crazy or insane, nothing like that at all. In other words, it's a condition which is just an electrical storm in the brain that, that creates, you know, uh, reflexes in the body that can't be controlled. And all of my friends were really supportive and I think from that point on is when I became more open about having epilepsy and you know sharing what it's like and all that kind of stuff with my friends. School staff should also be aware that some children with epilepsy have additional emotional and psychological challenges. Many people, uh, a number of people with, with epilepsy besides the seizures have depression, 
they may have learning disabilities as kids. They may have behavior problems such as ADHD or inattention. Like my son has you know, a lot of the hyperness and attention problems. So they need to be aware that that goes along with it. So don't reprimand the child, you know? You're gonna have a child that you're gonna have to repeat things to. And my son has a 504 plan in the school. So, you know, they, they have to repeat directions. They have to tell them the directions for an assignment before they hand them the piece of paper. Uh, because if not, they hand it to him. He's not gonna. He's not gonna listen. So there's there's things that a school can do to make the day go by a lot smoother for the child, and be aware that you know special things need to be done. Go, 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 go. In many cases, however, students with epilepsy do not have learning disabilities, and a supportive school system can ensure that students with epilepsy thrive in every way that kids do. I think one of the things the school system has to help in, people's friends have to help in, families have to help uh, create, is a situation that says 99.9% .9 of the time, your brain's fine. There's nothing wrong, okay? You can do anything you want to do. Uh, and I think in knowing that and in understanding that, uh, I think we wind up with, with young people who grow up to be everything that they were meant to be. Children with epilepsy should be able to participate in most school activities. They should be able to go on field trips, they should be able to engage in extracurricular activities, and they certain, certainly should be able to engage in sports. Sports is, are my way of like, not necessarily fighting back, but not letting epilepsy set me back. At school, Jake had a seizure in PE and the kids caught him before he hit the ground. That's what it's all about. It's all about people, you know, knowledge is empowering and, it, and it'll protect all of us. So keep talking about it. I'm right there with you. I'm not gonna stop fighting forever. I am not different than any other kid. Epilepsy, epilepsy. That's, that's the way you should look at it. Don't start treating me differently. I'm just the same person with a minor addition. For more information on seizure recognition, treatment, and epilepsy, visit epilepsyfoundation.org or call 1-800-332-1000.